Is the Mitsubishi Triton really the worst dual cab you can buy right now? Or were we wrong in our dual cab mega test? That's what this video is all about because we've got in a Mitsubishi Triton GSR, top of the range again, this time in Sunflare Orange. And today we're out here in the beautiful Blue Mountains testing out this car, living with it for a little bit longer to see whether or not the Triton grows on us over a week. Because here at Chasing Cars, we really do read your comments and on the dual cab mega test comment section, we saw a lot of fairly unhappy Mitsubishi owners that their beloved Tritons came at the bottom of the field. Now, that test was really focused a lot towards everyday usability and almost considering the dual cab as an SUV alternative because we here at Chasing Cars aren't exactly an off-road publication. So today, we're gonna to be testing this a little bit more in depth, living with it for the week as opposed to splitting our time between eight utes over seven days and finding out whether maybe the Triton does actually offer fantastic value and excellent off-roading skills. But of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions down below. So leave them there and let's get on with the video. Starting with three good and three bad bits of the Triton. Old underpinnings aren't all bad because it means that the Triton, like me, is rather skinny. It's 50 millimeters narrower than a Toyota Hilux and over 100 millimeters skinnier than a new Ford Ranger. It also has a pretty swift 11.8 meter turning circle. One of the crucial reasons buyers in Australia love the Triton is its affordable purchase price and well-known reliability. Sprinkle in that 10 year 200,000 K warranty and you've got a dependable ute. The Triton seems to have quite a low gearing for its low range transfer case. And that means when you're off-roading like we are now, you almost don't even need to rely on the hill descent control. This vehicle feels controlled and very confident off-road. It would be subjective to say that the Triton's interior is yuck but it's objective to say that this car is flawed. The driving position isn't great, there isn't that much cabin storage, and the seats are really quite uncomfortable. In 2009, with the MN Triton, Mitsubishi lengthened the tray of this ute to make it more practical, but they did so without lengthening the wheelbase. And that can mean compromises when you're carrying heavy loads, especially at the back of the tray, and that's something to look out for if you're looking at a Triton. When it comes to technology and creature comforts, the Triton sorely lacks touchscreen size and brightness. But really, the issue is that there's no digital speedo in this vehicle. That's something we reckon could have been easily rolled in and something that a lot of other competitors have. One of the criticisms we leveled at the Mitsubishi Triton were its aging underpinnings. Now the car next to me is the facelifted MR that debuted in 2019. Now you can tell it apart a little bit better without this rather fetching bull bar on the front because it's got the corporate dynamic shield grille behind it that matches with the ASX and the Outlander and of course the Pajero Sport that shares underpinnings with this car that we actually really rather like at chasing cars. But the thing is, even though it was new-ish in 2019, this Triton can actually trace its roots right back to 2006. It shares the same wheelbase as that vehicle did, the second generation of Triton, a three meter wheelbase. Now, things have changed and apparently the pre-facelift of this, the MQ generation of Triton, was 40% new in terms of chassis and 80% new in terms of its body. But the fact that it can trace its roots back does kind of hurt when you're paying about $60,000 or a little bit more even for this GSR on the road here in New South Wales, especially fitted with this Sunflare Orange paintwork and the roll top tonneau cover and bull bar as this vehicle is here. But yeah, the fact that it can trace routes back really pervades the experience of the Triton as we'll see when we jump inside and out on the road. So one of the great things about the Triton is its size. We're in sort of fairly tight, but not overly technical trails. I guess you'd call them sort of blue trails out the back of Lithgow um, on the way to the Lost City. And this little Triton can squeeze through little gaps and it's really easy to thread this car through tight technical terrain like this. I think easier than the, some of the larger dual cabs and you, you really do feel that. It likes being tossed around on this sort of stuff and you can take it easy. And of course, you've got all the off-road smarts to deal with as well. I've currently got this vehicle in low range with the locked center diff. Now you can have high range four wheel drive with a locked center diff as well, or you can have uh, high range four wheel drive without a locked center diff. Now all of those options are great because it means you can actually drive the Triton in four wheel drive all the time. But this is about the fun stuff. We're on a little technical, little challenge here. It should be pretty doable with this car. Um, I'm gonna try it first without the rear diff locked and see if we can't succeed. It's just a set of little moguls up here, um, sort of slightly offset and it might ground out a little bit and that's where you might wanna go for a slight lift kit if you're gonna be off-roading a Triton a lot. But here we go. We grounds the belly a bit Oop, in that low range. Now this is the tricky bit. Let's see if we can get up without the lock diff. No chance without the lock diff. Have to uh, eat that one. 
roll back down. Da, 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 da. Unfortunately, let's lock the diff. Easy to do with that little button there. Back down, wait till it's engaged. She is engaged. All right, now this is the beauty of the lock differential. Standard on uh, Triton models from GLXR upwards, I think. But, like butter. <laughs> and it loves it. It's funny. It's such a different experience to driving quickly on the track or something like that, which is what I'd normally do. That's what I'd normally be getting my kicks out of. But I gotta say, the more I do a little bit of recreational four-wheel driving, the more I like it. And I think the Triton, if you're gonna be doing this sort of stuff, then the Triton does make a really good use case for itself with all those clever off-road smarts, its small size, it's sort of relatively affordable price tag, means you're not off-roading something like a Ford Ranger Raptor, where you might feel really bad about scratching it up. And of course it's reliable and there's plenty of aftermarket support for a vehicle like this to just make it that little bit better. Maybe a bit of a lift kit, maybe some higher quality dampers, because the rear dampers on this MR Triton are pretty small in their diameter. And going for something a little bit bigger is not only going to give you a better ride quality off-road, but also on-road and mean it's a better vehicle when you're towing the maximum 3.1 tonne rated towing capacity. Now Mitsubishi has also said, which gives credence to me finding this car quite fun off-road, Mitsubishi Australia has said that there's life left in the Triton yet. And it sounds like there's an approach from a third party manufacturing company that might end up with a Nissan Navara Warrior style rival. So if we get to see that, it's gonna be pretty awesome, I reckon, because this car really does love it off-road in the rough stuff. Away from technical trails and rocky features, muddy puddles, the thing about a dual cab now is that it's expected to do so much more than it ever had been before. Vehicles like the Ford Ranger really have a focus on technology and safety. The same can be said of the Isuzu D-Max and Mazda BT50, forthcoming Toyota Hilux, and it leaves vehicles that are a little bit older, not that much older than the underpinnings of those cars I just mentioned, but ultimately vehicles like the Nissan Navara and this Mitsubishi Triton do feel a little bit old hat among today's best competitors. And where I am right now is the kind of place where you might toss up whether or not you want something like a dual cab or even something like a large or mid-size SUV because right now I'm just driving on a nice smooth-ish forestry road. And as good as the Triton is off-road on technical trails, there are some issues on roads like this. One of those though is not the ESP tuning. Mitsubishi has done a great job of making sure that this Triton allows just enough fun on dirt without letting you get away with too much. Even when you turn traction control off in rear wheel drive only mode, you can't get it to go that sideways. And it seems the tuning is quite deft in the way that it lets you gather the car up. It adds quite a lot of confidence as to these all terrain Bridgestone tires fitted to this vehicle. But as you can probably see right now and hear from my voice, there is a choppiness to this vehicle's ride. And it's a choppiness that you wouldn't get in something like a Mitsubishi Pajero Sport with its coil sprung rear end, arguably not in a Nissan Navara Pro 4X Warrior, and certainly not in an equivalent SUV, that if you're gonna be doing the occasional dirt road like this, then an SUV is better. But I have a hunch that over, I don't know, say 200,000 kilometers, this Mitsubishi Triton is probably gonna hold up better. It feels stout and strong. And even though it might not be the most comfortable thing in the world, obviously, if you put a bit of extra load in that tray and expect it to drive like an old school dual cab, then I think you'll be getting exactly what you need from a dual cab unit. If the Triton looks butch and tough from the outside, when you jump into the cabin of this upspec GSR model, it all sort of starts to fall apart a little bit. You can see the age of this cabin's underpinnings. And even though Mitsubishi has added touches like this actually rather responsive touchscreen that has Apple CarPlay, it's still a very small touchscreen and it is incredibly dim to use. So you can sort of barely see it in bright Australian sunlight. Below that though, we do have a nice easy to operate climate control panel, but then yeah, this sort of datedness comes back. You've got passenger airbag lights and your seatbelt signs that are really massive and could have been better put to use for other technology. For example, putting the heated seat buttons up here. You do have two stage heating for both front seats in this GSR. That's nice because you need the heating because there's not that much support and there's very little lumbar in these seats, which means having that warmth in your back is sort of the only way to soothe you on a long drive like today. 
But look, it is functional, the interior isn't sexy, and that is what lost this car points on our dual cab mega test, especially when compared to rivals that have really moved the game on. But honestly, if you're using this vehicle like you would a normal dual cab, I can see how you might think it will be just fine. Mitsubishi has added a nice soft pad here on upspec Tritons for the latest facelift after the MQ model, um, because models before that didn't have any padding, even on top spec models, so that's really nice. You still have very hard scratchy door cards where you rest your arm and up here and the steering wheel that is leather wrapped doesn't feel particularly high quality it's sort of quite ugly and forespoky even though you get these nice mitsubishi evo inspired paddles look it is all a little bit of a mixed bag the good things are that it's easy to find things that you need to access and interact with. The gear stick's very simple to use, aircon, all that sort of stuff. You can jump in from this vehicle from an older dual cab and feel right at home, but it just doesn't feel as $60,000 would get you in some other rival brands. For example, an Isuzu D-Max is a much better resolved technology package for the same price as you can get this top spec GSR Premium. The other thing is that the cabin storage isn't particularly great. There's nowhere really to put your mobile phone. You do have two cup holders and reasonable sized door bins, but the cubby under the soft armrest is pretty decently sized and a great spot to leave things that you don't want people outside the vehicle to see. As it is one of the narrowest dual cabs on sale, the Triton's back seat is only really good for four. But for me at six foot two, my level of space isn't too bad. Certainly headroom's okay, but things like knee room and toe room are a little bit compromised. The bench though is nicely inclined and there I say, almost comfortable. You don't have that many amenities back here though, scratchy door clouds, just like in the front seat, and you also don't have air vents back here, but you do have a USB charging port and the air vents are actually hidden up here in the roof in what Ponch affectionately called Princess Leia's hairdryer. It's also not the greatest vehicle if you wanna put baby seats in the back of, so if you are gonna be carrying young kids, I definitely say if you're able to not buy yourself a dual cab, buy an SUV instead because it is a pain to get the baby seats in and out and they're probably not gonna to be too safe in the back seat here. The top of the line GSR grade can be told apart by a little bit of a black pack up the front and then here you got your black GSR badge. But honestly, in our book here at Chasing Cars, the best value in the Triton range does not lie up here in the blingy GSR. Rather, the GLS, which also comes equipped with that super select four wheel drive system and without this really annoying to open standard fit roll top tonneau cover which i will pop open now um, i just think that vehicle makes a bit more sense of course there's also the glxr um, at sort of the base model of the range and that's probably where you get most value from your triton but still the gsr gets this nice plastic bed liner to protect the bed and it is a fairly usable space i'll put the dimensions on the screen right now and that's pretty much all you need to know, including the payload of this vehicle. Fuel consumption is never something that dual cab utes are particularly good at. The driving that we've done around town, on highways, and out here on some four wheel driving trails has seen it climb to 11.1 .1 liters per 100 kilometers. Servicing is due every 12 months or 15,000 kilometers, which is a pretty decent interval for a ute like this. And it's gonna cost you $2,595 over five years or 75,000 kilometers to maintain your Mitsubishi Triton. And if you do that at a Mitsubishi dealer and keep to the scheduled servicing, Mitsubishi will extend the warranty from a usual five years up to a 10 year, 200,000 kilometer diamond guarantee, which is in a way best in class. As for insurance, the median budget direct customer over the last 12 months paid $1,025 to comprehensively insure their new Mitsubishi Triton. Now your premium may vary based on things that insurers take into account, such as where you live, your driving history, and whether or not you garage the vehicle. Out here on the open road is really where the Triton experience falls down compared to the newer series of dual cabs out there on the market, specifically that new Ford Ranger that really does show this thing how it should be able to do on-road dynamics. But for that to happen, the Triton's gonna need a whole new rethink. And if you're willing to live with the fact that this is an old school dual cab and it provides on-road manners like you're used to from a previous generation, then arguably the Triton is fine but still there are some things we've got to talk about, starting with that engine, which has a decent amount of power and torque, 133 kilowatts of power, 430 newton meters of torque, not enough to trouble any of the other rivals in the segment, but actually out on the road up to about 80 k's an hour, the engine kicks pretty hard and it recorded a fairly decent 0 to 100 kilometer an hour time, but the 0 to 60 time was actually pretty impressive. It really does have a little bit of a mule kick in the, mid in the mid range of that rev band, but it doesn't really do anything when you get a little bit further. 
and the six-speed gearbox does hold gears a little bit longer. It'd be interesting to see if this car was fitted with the eight-speed torque converter from the Mitsubishi Pajero Sport wagon bodied SUV, if it would do any better. But as is, it feels like a pretty old school dual cab. You can also get a six speed manual transmission. I think an automatic is gonna be the default choice for most buyers. And so, yeah, it works just fine. Nothing particularly special. The other thing that isn't particularly special about this Triton is the way it goes down a road. Now we're out here on these sort of nice flowing roads west of Sydney in the Blue Mountains and the handling dynamics aren't terrible but it feels a bit disjointed. The front end is really quite soft in this car and the steering is really vague and quite slow. 3.8 turns lock to lock, which is quick for an older dual cab, but in today's market, it really does feel quite slow, especially compared to something like an SUV. If you were gonna be cross shopping a ute with that, you'd really understand the differences if you got this thing out on a twisty road. The other thing is that ride frequency means that it kind of hops about and especially around town, the Triton really transmits sharp edge bumps into the cabin, not only through the rear end when it's unladen, which is kind of expected, but mainly through the front end. You can feel a harsh bump coming through the steering wheel when you hit one of Sydney's many potholes at the moment. It is actually quite an unpleasant experience. And although this dual cab is a lot narrower than some of its rivals, about 110 millimeters narrower than a new Ford Ranger, which makes it really easy to thread through city back streets. The discomfort of doing so over short, low speed bumps means that, yeah, the Triton isn't great. If you hit those bumps with a bit more speed, it seems to iron them out a little bit better, but yeah, honestly, it's sort of quite validating that we did put this vehicle last in our dual cab Megatest because of that steering the vagueness and of course the safety, which was quite impressive when this vehicle first launched, uh, you know, the big revamp of Triton in 2015 and then again in 2018 where they added more safety features to more grades. But it's still missing things that we really come to expect as standard on pretty much every car in the Australian new vehicle market, not just because this is a dual cab, but something like adaptive cruise control on this vehicle that costs a little bit over $60,000 on the road would go a long way. We also don't have a lane trace assist, it's just a lane departure warning. And the AEB or forward collision warning seemed to trigger pretty aggressively on this car pretty early. But at least the visibility out of the Triton is pretty good. Got a nice glass house. The bonnet slopes away enough so it's fairly easy to judge when you're parking, the reversing camera isn't too bad and you've got front and rear parking sensors as well. So to answer the title of the video, were we wrong to give the Mitsubishi Triton the wooden spoon in our dual cab mega test? Well, I think living with it for about a week has given credence to the fact that judged by the criteria that we used for that test, the Mitsubishi Triton is probably the least best of all of those dual cabs we tested but we didn't put much weight on off-road testing. And out here, just east of Lithgow, having fun on these four-wheel drive trails is where this Mitsubishi Triton really makes sense. It is an old school dual cab. It is rough around the edges, but get it out here on the rough stuff and there's plenty to enjoy. Of course, as I said before and throughout this video, I think there's better value in the Triton range than this flagship GSR variant. The GLS or even the GLXR with its selectable normal four-wheel drive system is probably gonna offer you plenty of value and all the stuff you need from the Triton because the trimmings of the leather interior and the black pack don't really bring the Triton that much further in our opinion here at Chasing Cars. But of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts because I just think the Triton's on-road manners and safety kit really start to look a little bit old in today's age where the Ford Ranger and soon to launch Volkswagen Amarok, not to mention the Isuzu D-Max and Mazda BT-50 twins have really pushed the safety game forwards and mean that they're much easier vehicles to live with every day. But of course, let me know your thoughts down below. And while you're there leaving your opinions, why not hit subscribe to Chasing Cards if you haven't done so already. And as always, thank you very much for watching.